Good morning, everybody. Welcome to worship. It's so good to see all of you. It's a beautiful morning, and uh, it's just great to uh, gather together to worship and to see each other again and share in fellowship. Uh, welcome to any of our visitors and guests who joined us today, whether you are here in person or watching via the live stream. Welcome to all of you who are watching via the live stream as well. Thank you to Lynn for her willingness and ability to play music for us today as Ed is away with a family commitment. It's wonderful to work with you again, Lynn, and thank you so much. As is the custom here, I am told here at St. Peter's, we are switching to a new liturgical setting, setting four, which is found in the ELW Red Hymnal uh, that you can find in your pew. Obviously, we're going to use the slides here as well, uh, but it begins on page 147. And uh, if you are watching from home, obviously, please use your slides there as well. For those of you who are worshiping from home and wish to participate in communion, you are more than welcome to do so. I invite you to find items that are appropriate for communion, whether it is a piece of bread or a bun or a cracker. And for your drink, you can use water or juice or leftover wine from dinner the night before. As always, here at St. Peter's, all are welcome to participate in communion. Uh, today, we are going to explore the meaning and the significance of Sabbath, and I'm looking forward to it because it's a fascinating topic. So may we all continue to know and feel the presence, the love, and the grace of God for every single one of us in this place or wherever it is we are gathered today. I invite you now to take a moment of quiet reflection and centering as we prepare our hearts and our minds for worship. I invite you to please stand as you are able. Let's join in singing our opening hymn, number 532, Gather Us In.
The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit is with you all. I invite you to please be seated, and I invite any children who are here to come forward, please. Well, good morning, everybody. How are you all doing today? Good. Did you have a good week? Yeah? Good. I'm glad to hear that. Um, Today, we are going to, uh, the grown-ups, we are going to talk about um, an idea, a reality, for, for some people anyways, of something called Sabbath. Have you ever heard of the word Sabbath before? No. Any of the parents, the grown-ups, you've heard of Sabbath, right? Anybody listen to Black Sabbath when they were growing up? Oh, okay. Um, So the word Sabbath is from uh, the Jewish religion, and it is um, a day of rest from your work. Now, do any of you have jobs yet? No? Do you have chores to do at home? Yeah? Okay. Well, when you're a bit older, you're going to get a job, and you're going to work yeah, hopefully 40 hours a week, and um, most people, they get the weekend off, or two days is what the law says you should get off of work. So that comes from this idea of Sabbath. Now, many thousands of years ago, a group of people known as the Israelites, they were slaves in a land called Egypt. You've heard of Egypt, right? Yeah. So. They lived there for 400, 450 years, and they were the slaves of, of the Egyptian pharaoh. And the pharaoh was such a, not a nice guy, that he would make them work seven days a week, and they think somewhere about 18 hours a day. So they did not get a lot of rest, and they did not get a day off. And they were forced to make bricks and build various buildings and temples and, you know, all sorts of different wonderful things that you can still see today. But when those people left Egypt, they went to a place uh, through what's called the Sinai Desert, and it took them 40 years to get across. But while they were wandering, God called Moses to the top of the mountain and said, I'd like to give this group of people some new laws and new commandments, like the Ten Commandments, so that you can figure out how you're going to live as a new country. And part of that uh, law was to say, you will have one full day of rest from your work. And it wasn't just the people, it was the animals as well. So if, say, they had ox that would plow the field or they had, you know, whatever the animals did for the people, the animals also got a day of rest from their work. Now, we get a weekend, but they didn't. And thanks to that story and its influence on our Western civilization, this is where we get the weekend from so we can have some time to rest. Now, I know that you don't have jobs yet, but you also go to school and you've got lots of extracurricular activities, you've got lots going on. What do you do to find time to rest other than going to sleep at night? What do you do for a bit of rest to replenish your energy? Micah. Play video games on the iPad. All right. What else? Does anybody else? What else do you do? You do a reading. Excellent. That's my favorite thing to do. Anybody else? What do you do to find some rest or some downtime for yourself? Yeah. Oh, you forget. (laughs) Okay. We'll come back to you. Do some reading as well. Good. Anybody else down here? What do you do? Oh, you do drawing and coloring. I love that. That's a great way to find some downtime. Edwin? Nothing. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. I like that one. Ooh, do some sketching. Excellent. So, Galen, you want to say something? Nothing. Nothing. All right. (laughs) Proverbial pancakes. I like that. Um, So, whatever you choose to do to find time for rest... Remember that there are still people in our world who don't get days off and don't get rest from their work. And they work and they work and they work and they work and they work. 
and uh, it's just really not fair. So make sure that you enjoy that time. Make sure that your mom and your dad enjoy that time as well because your parents work really hard and they want to make sure you've got the things that you need. So do whatever you can and whatever you like, whether it's playing outside, playing a video game, just snoozing, resting, walking, exercise, playing with the dog, whatever it is, find that time to make sure you get the rest that you need so you can stay strong and healthy and have good minds as well. So let's pray, and then you can head on down for Sunday school. Loving and gracious God, today we thank you for the gift of Sabbath rest and for the time that we can take to rejuvenate and uh, to replenish our energy and to help our minds and our bodies find a bit of peace and calm in the midst of the hecticness of the things that we participate, whether it's at school or in our extracurricular activities, whatever it is. Help our moms and our dads and our grandparents to also make sure that they take the time they need to rest and uh, let us be reminders to them that it's okay to take time off and rest and relax. So thank you for this beautiful day, and we enjoy the opportunity now to go down and learn some more things in Sunday school. We pray this in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks so much, everybody, for coming up. Have a great time downstairs, and enjoy the rest of your week. I invite everybody to, oh, yes, please stand. <laughs> the Lord is with you. Let us pray. The law is easy, Jesus. Lists to be made, items ticked as each is fulfilled. Love is messy, people to be heard and seen, consequences and compassion to be considered. But we've lived too long by law the law of the sword taking lives to achieve our goals, the law of the market seeking gain without thought of the impact, the law of religion handing out judgment in your name. But the poor and the weak, the diseased and the lonely, the rejected and the sinful find no healing in our laws. So teach us to love Jesus as you do, enough to defend the helpless, and overturn the tables of the powerful, enough to sacrifice ourselves so others may live. Teach us to love Jesus as you do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I invite you to please be seated as we hear our readings. Our first reading this morning is from Exodus, chapter 20, verses 1 through 17. God spoke all these words, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above or that is on the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing children for the iniquity of parents to the third 
and the fourth generation of those who reject me, but showing steadfast love to the thousandth generation of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not acquit anyone who misuses the divine name. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall not do any work, you, your son or your daughter, your male or your female slave, your livestock, or the alien resident in your towns. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, but rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and consecrated it. Honor your father and your mother, so that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's spouse, male or female slave, ox, donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. The word of the Lord. We will now uh, speak the psalm together, uh, responsively, led by uh, Sherry. Me. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky proclaims its maker's handiwork. One day tells its tale to another, and one night imparts knowledge to another. Although they have no words or language, and their voices are not heard, their sound has gone out into all lands, and their message to the ends of the world, where God has pitched a tent for the sun. It comes forth like a bridegroom out of his chamber. It rejoices like a champion to run its course. It goes forth from the uttermost edge of the heavens and runs about to the end of it again. Nothing is hidden from its burning heat. The teaching of the Lord is perfect and revives the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure and gives wisdom to the simple. The statutes of the Lord are just and rejoice the heart. The commandments of the Lord is clear and gives light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean and endures forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, more than much fine gold, sweeter far than honey, than honey in the comb. By them also is your servant enlightened, and in keeping them there is great reward. Who can detect one's own offenses? Cleanse me from my secret faults. Above all, keep your servant from presumptuous sins. Let them not get dominion over me. Then shall I be whole and sound and innocent of a great offense. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Our second reading is from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 18 through 25. The message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scholar? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, God decided through the foolishness of the proclamation to save those who believe. For Jews ask for signs and Greeks desire wisdom, but we proclaim Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. 
For God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom, and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I invite you to please stand as you are able as we sing the Lenten version of our gospel acclamation. This is the Holy Gospel according to St. John, the second chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. The Passover of the Jewish people was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, Take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house will consume me. The people then said to Jesus, What sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered, Destroy the temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The people responded, This temple has been under construction for 46 years, and will you raise it up again in three days? But Jesus was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, the disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Let us pray. Gracious God, you have built rest from our work right into the creation of all that is. Rest from our work seems to be a challenge for far too many people in our society. Help us, inspire us, encourage us to find our rest from work so that we can be the best version of ourselves as you have intended. Amen. I invite you to please be seated. This morning, as I said at the beginning of the service, I'd like to explore a fascinating topic found throughout the Bible, but which originates in the Torah, and we heard it from the book of Exodus this morning when God gives Moses the Ten Commandments. The Torah are the first five books of the Bible. In fact, this topic of Sabbath starts in the very first chapter of the Bible. In that first version of creation found in Genesis 1, the author, whom we now know is from the priestly class, develops their version of creation in such a way that makes God to be understood as an architect. What does an architect do? They design buildings. They design rooms within those buildings. They create spaces in which people can live and work and play. Well, this author of Genesis chapter 1 is telling their audience that God does the same thing in creating the world. Now, think back to Sunday school and confirmation. On days 1, 2, and 3, God creates the rooms of the world, of creation, okay? Days 4, 5, and 6, God decorates those rooms with living things, so separating light and dark creating water above, water below, and the dry land, and those things, and then God then populates sun, moon, and stars, birds, fish, animals, and human beings. Now, the most important day is not the sixth day when God creates human beings. And let's face it, which one of us does our best work on a late Friday afternoon before the weekend? No offense to anybody, but think about the progression. (laughs) All right, the most important day of creation, according to this author from the priestly class, is the seventh day, the day on which God rests from the work God has done in creation. Now, why was that seventh day most important? Because not even God can not work on that seventh day. Now, let me be clear. 
The book of Genesis was not written at the moment of creation. No one was floating in that primordial nothingness with a quill and papyrus waiting for things to happen and to record it. Genesis 1 is a powerful theological metaphor for what the priestly class believed was the most important day of the week, the Sabbath day. The priestly class developed this story to say, see, it's always been this way. Even God rested on the seventh day. Now so should you. When you read the texts dealing with Sabbath, you will find something quite fascinating occurring in all of them. First is the reason why Sabbath is so important. For the Israelites living in oppressive slavery in Egypt, as I said to the Sunday school kids, they did not experience Sabbath of any kind. But once they liberated themselves and Moses goes up on Mount Sinai to receive the law, a day of rest from all work was specifically added to the law. Now think about that. This is in the law. This is the Torah. This is the big, the big thing. You cannot break this. It means that a day of rest cannot be skipped for any reason of any kind. Now, for us modern-day people who are busy 27 hours a day, nine days of the week, it seems that many people in our society are overworked and stressed out to the max as a result. Now, for us who attend church on Sunday mornings, this is our Sabbath day, we often assume that this day off is so that we can go to church. But that's not what it meant originally. Sabbath was not about going to the synagogue. Secondly, you will find that the law provides us with more than one type of Sabbath, and this is where things get really interesting. So let's take a look. Uh, Greg, thanks for that first slide there. So just take a look there. Now, the Sabbath day happened every seven days, and our days now start at midnight and end at midnight. But in the ancient world, they started at 6 p.m. and went to 6 p.m. the next day. So Sabbath originally was Friday night, 6 p.m. until Saturday evening the next day. Now, again, for us modern-day Christians, we often see Sunday as a day off from work to go to church or to worship or for worship. But the original meaning of Sabbath was rest from your work, and that was seen as worship. All right, and if you want to read more, you can look at the stories there from Exodus and from Deuteronomy. Now, these three texts are addressed to what is called the householders of Israel, and that was both men and women um, who were in charge of their homes and it concerned how the Sabbath would be observed in their home. And it applied to everybody living in the house, including slaves and servants, children and animals. And isn't it interesting, even if you have what the Bible calls resident aliens, refugees or people from foreign countries in your community, they were not to be forced to do your work for you. Everybody got a day off of work, okay? So it's not about a day off to go to synagogue or to church but it is deeply and profoundly about the just distribution of rest from your work, and it was understood as an act of worship in itself. And again, that comes from not getting any rest and time off as slaves in Egypt, okay? And it's built right into creation. Not even God can skip it, okay? Now, how does that sound to all of you? How does that sound? Sounds pretty good, huh? How well do we do that in our modern world, though? A great many of the issues that we face as a society are often the result of people who are overworked and not getting enough rest, and that leads to resentment and anger, and it also leads to disease and illness. Now, there is a second type of Sabbath rest that is written into the law and let me say that this now is where the most radical stuff in the Bible shows up. It's not in the Gospels. It's actually here in the Torah. So please get ready for it. <laughs> the next two slides tell us about what is called the Sabbath year. It was celebrated every seven year, and it was also meant to give rest to the land itself. Now, this is the fun part. 
you would also forgive all debt. Take that MasterCard and Visa. <laughs> you would forgive all debt. And if anybody was considered an indentured servant, like so they couldn't pay back the loan they took from you for seed because of war or famine or bad crops, then they would work off their debt as your servant. Their entire family would work with them. And so if that was a situation, you would forgive them that debt and everything would be kind of a level playing field again. Now, can you imagine that happening in our world today? In that one reading there, Exodus 23, it talks about since the entire land could not be left fallow all at once, one-seventh, again, the number seven being very important, reflecting Sabbath, a seventh of all produce that was grown would be left on the field for the poor among the communities to go get what they need to eat. And the reading from Leviticus 23 talks about everything in the land is to rest in that seventh year, but food that is harvested in the previous six years is to be stored so that it can be used for the seventh year. Leviticus 23 was very radical, and it was meant to be like shock treatment to make the people who heard that realize that God's planet, God's home, God's land was a living thing and that it too needed rest from its work. How appropriate would that be for modern day? We do have a lot of issues with soil not having the same nutrients anymore. And again, it's about a distributive justice, not just for humans and for animals, but for the land itself. And how about having all your debt forgiven every seven years? That is really amazing. This is built right into the law so that no one was either too rich or too impoverished for too long. It was a radical way to level the playing field in society. Fascinating. And now there's one more type of Sabbath that we are taught about in the law. We have tons of evidence in the Bible that the Sabbath day and the Sabbath year were observed in ancient times pretty faithfully and quite religiously. What is harder to learn was if this third type of Sabbath was observed regularly. Now I say that because there was often systemic violence from foreign empires invading and conquering that interrupted this third type of Sabbath. The next two slides tell us that this type of Sabbath was known as the Jubilee year. So seven times seven is 49, and it was celebrated though in the 50th year. This is considered the climax of the entire Sabbath process of restoring justice and righteousness that runs through the entire Torah. This Sabbath Jubilee would begin on the Day of Atonement, what Jews called Yom Kippur. And it was a way to atone, to ask for forgiveness and to receive forgiveness for what was happening in the land over those past 50 years. <clears throat> now, this is really quite something. <laughs> the purpose of this Jubilee year is to return all alienated property to its original family ownership. It was seen as a return to the original distribution of the land to its original inhabitants and owners. Since the world belongs to God, humans, at least according to the Bible, cannot buy or sell land. Therefore, the Jubilee reminds us that we are not here to mortgage and foreclose, and that we ourselves do not own the earth. This Jubilee year was a reminder to us that we are to be good stewards of God's world and all that is in and on it. Now again, can you imagine that happening in our world today? A lot of credit card companies would be out of business. <laughs> the, the tables would be, as Jesus does in the story in the Gospels, the tables would be really flipped over if the world operated this way. Now, these three types of Sabbaths were to remind people of all that they had left behind in Egypt. The whole point of all of this stuff that we've learned about today 
was to encourage the people who had escaped Egyptian slavery to never allow oppression and slavery to happen, not only in their own new country, but anywhere else in the world. In many ways, the Sabbath and the Jubilee counter or resist what's called the normalcy of civilization, our tendency towards violence and greed and power and things like that. What these three types of Sabbaths were really about at the end of the day is about everybody having enough for every single day, every person on this planet. We talked about this today in in confirmation. If I were a single person, my individual needs would be different than what I am in right now as a family of six, but it would be different for someone who came from a family of 15, right? The idea of Sabbath rest and these other concepts, the Jubilee and the, the Sabbath year, is about making sure everybody in the household got their fair share, right? But my family's needs are different from yours and from theirs and from them, right? But what happens in the world still is that we have very few that have access to more and too many that don't have access to enough. And then that middle ground where we are getting what we need. And yeah, there are going to be people among us who are going to scoff at all of this and say, yeah, but this Sabbath stuff is just pie in the sky. And then they're going to ask, you know, who in their right mind would give up all of that wealth and land and status? You know, geez, Louise, pull yourself up by your bootstraps and work hard. You know, but that's not the way God operates. And that's the exact attitude that these Sabbaths are trying to curb because what happens is exactly what we experience in the world today. As I said, far too few have too much. There are many with just enough, but there's a lot more with not enough. So during this Lenten season, I invite us all to reflect on the deeper significance of Sabbath in our lives. Not just our weekly Sabbath and making sure we get our day off and and do things to rejuvenate ourselves, but let us also get more deeper into the idea of Sabbath at all levels of our lives and in the human experience. What can we learn from this that might help us as Christians help those in need around us meet their daily needs, or to sustainably use our planet and its resources, or to seek change in banking and mortgage lending systems? And I have to ask the question, can Sabbath at these three levels even be possible anymore in our modern world? But we must start small. So let's start with our weekly Sabbath. And yes, for us, it includes going to church to worship and to share in fellowship. That's just what it has become. But I invite and encourage us all to try and see that your day off, no matter how you choose to spend it, is, at least from what we've learned here today, an act of worship. And I'm going to suggest that God does not care how you spend that time. And why do I say that? Because you are not being forced into work without rest anymore. No matter what you do with your Sabbath rest is making the most of that incredible gift of rest. And at the end of the day, God is happy with that. And God sees that and says, it is very good. Amen. I invite you to please stand as you are able. We'll join in singing our hymn of the day, number 723, Canticle of the Turning.
We now take a moment to confess our faith. We'll use the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sin, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The love, the grace, the peace, and the light of Christ are always with you. Let's take a minute or two to share signs of those things with each other. I invite you to please stand as you are able as we join in singing our offertory hymn. God, our provider, you have not fed us with bread alone, but with words of grace and life. Bless us and these your gifts, which we receive from your bounty, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. God of mercy and healing, you who hear the cries of those in need, receive these petitions of your people that, are, that all who are troubled may know peace, comfort, and courage. We respond to God of grace with, hear our prayer. The church is beset with apathy, weariness, and fear. Work through church leaders to inspire, encourage, and equip your people to proclaim your love and justice to all the world. God of grace, hear our prayer. Creation grows in distress, groans in distress and brokenness. Give wisdom and strength to all who use the soil and see to its health and care. God of grace, hear our prayer. People of all nations and creeds, bear your image. Help us to value human dignity and to pursue reconciliation and peace among all communities. God of grace, hear our prayer. Human systems of justice are broken and imperfect. Bless law enforcement officers, attorneys, and judges with compassion and an earnest desire to rehabilitate rather than incarcerate. 
God of grace, hear our prayer. Many in the world suffer from disease and pain. Grant healing and comfort to those fighting illness and despair. God of grace, hear our prayer. Communities, both near and far, lack basic necessities. Work through us that the abundance you provide may bless ever more and more people. God of grace, hear our prayer. Countless faithful servants, countless faithful saints now rest in you. Keep their witness to your love ever in front of us that we may join them in peace eternal. God of grace, hear our prayer. We also pray for the people of Free Reformed Church Bornholm and their pastor, John Procy, Karen, our cleaner, and Deb, the keeper of the keys, and for the people of St. Paul Leamington and their pastor, Sylvia Swatoschik. God of grace, hear our prayer. Life-giving God, heal our lives that we may acknowledge your wonderful deeds and offer you thanks from generation to generation through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. At this point, I'd like to invite all of you who are watching via the live stream, if you are uh, interested in participating in communion, to bring together your items, place them in front of you, and hold your hands in a gesture of blessing like this above those items as we hear and speak these words together. The Lord is with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should everywhere and always offer thanks and praise through Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit, who call us to follow their way of humble service and love. And so, with the church on earth, with the saints and all creation, the host of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. For the power of love in human life and history, we give our thanks and praise. Long ago, our ancestors knew love's power, and they became the tellers of love's tale. Love bound them in covenant, teaching them to live in community with compassion and concern for the poorest among them. Yet centuries of domination and violence shaped a different kind of community based on selfishness and inequality. In the struggle against oppression, Jesus became the face of love, showing us the way to abundant life. In both word and deed, Jesus announced love's new reign of justice, reconciliation, and peace. Filled with the courage and the passion of love's Holy Spirit, Jesus gave his life to challenge the unjust systems of our world. On the last night of his life, Jesus took bread, he blessed it, and he broke it, and he gave it to all gathered, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, and it is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. In the same way, Jesus took a cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to all gathered, saying, This cup is the renewed covenant in my blood. It is shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. God of love, spirit of compassion, bless us and this bread and wine. May this meal be food and drink for our journey, renewing, sustaining, and making us whole. When we eat this bread and drink from this cup, we experience again the presence of Jesus in our midst. And now, infused with God's Holy Spirit, we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, 
Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. As most of you are aware, you are obviously invited to come to communion now, but we do have more than the one option. For those who prefer or require the gluten-free option, that is available. Let me know when you come forward. We also have grape juice uh, instead of wine for those who so desire. Now, for those of you who are worshiping from home, I invite you now to gather together your bread and your, your drink, and I will commune with you. This is the body of Christ, the bread of life, given in love for you. And this is the blood of Christ, the wine of peace, also given in love for you. These are the gifts of God for the free and forgiven people of God. Come, for now all is ready. Thank you. 
Lord. I invite you to please stand as you are able. May this meal nourish us and refresh us. May it strengthen us and renew us. May it unite us and keep us in God's gracious love and loving grace now and forever. Amen. Let us pray. Compassionate God, you have fed us with the bread of heaven. Sustain us in our Lenten pilgrimage. May our fasting be hunger for justice, our alms a making of peace, and our prayer the song of grateful hearts. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. There are just a few announcements I'd like to share with you today. As many of you are aware, this coming Wednesday, St. Peter's is hosting the Seaforth Ministerial Lenten Luncheon. Uh, It begins at 12 and ends around 1 or shortly thereafter. It will be a light lunch. Um, Our speaker will be from Shelterlink. I don't know who it is just yet, but they have promised one of the head two people will be here to, to share the work that they're doing and to tell us all about what, what, what they're doing and, and how we've uh, helped them over the years. Um, a free will donation is going to be collected and it will all go towards helping support ShelterLink and their work. I think there are two more, after, uh, two more luncheons after we host. Uh, if you're interested in joining in, the, the, the sites and the locations are uh, posted in the narthex. Uh, the season of Lent is a time uh, designated by Council for a food drive to support our local food banks. The boxes are set out on the floor by the bench in the back narthex. Thank you to those who have already contributed, and we uh, hope that we will continue to show our generosity for those in need uh, in our community. This coming Friday is the International Ecumenical World Day of Prayer service, and it's being held at 2 p.m. this coming Friday at Grace Lutheran Church. Uh, in Mitchell. So if you have the time and you're able to come out, uh, it'll be a lovely service and it'll be a nice way to catch up with uh, friends from other churches in the area. Please mark your calendars for uh, Saturday, March the 23rd at 9 a.m. for an interior cleaning of our sanctuary. Uh, This is when they're going to be getting up into the higher nooks and crannies uh, that are not part of the weekly cleaning process. So if you can bring some cleaning supplies and again, Coffee and donuts will be supplied. I'm I'm sure that's an incentive for a lot of us, so uh, please remember many hands make light work, and uh, it'd be great to see you all. Uh, Please check back uh, the back of your worship guide for other services and events that are coming up, and if you haven't picked up your charitable receipt yet, they are in a box in the narthex. Make sure you grab one on the way out. Am I overlooking anything, missing any announcement? And I invite you now all to receive God's blessing. May the Lord bless us and keep us. May the Lord's face shine on us with grace and with compassion. May the Lord continue to look upon us all with deep love and give us and our world deep and lasting peace. Amen. Let's join in singing our sending hymn number 815, I Want to Walk as a Child of the Light.
Before we're dismissed, again, I hope we have some food for thought. This is part of my plan always as a pastor. Help us think, gain some new insight and deeper levels and layers of understanding of the things we've heard so many times over and over again. Um, But I wanted to also say thank you again to Lynn for playing our music today. You did an amazing job, so let's show her our appreciation. Friends, I invite you now to go in peace, to love and serve the Lord and your neighbor. Thanks be to God.